Well, it's uh, great to be with you at Virtually Keswick, isn't it, Christy? And uh, we're really excited to be digging into the topic in this seminar of how we can share hope with friends. And so really big topic, really big issues around that, especially with the pandemic and coronavirus. So, Christy, how can we begin thinking about that topic of hope, especially in today's uh, complicated world that we find ourselves in? That's such a great question. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, I was chatting with one of my friends the other week. She doesn't yet know Jesus. And when I asked her how she was doing during these unusual times, I was quite taken aback to hear her answer. She's from a middle class background, materially wealthy, excellent job, uh, loved, well known, large family, part of the community, respected, etc, etc, all those good things. And I half expected her to say that she was really enjoying furlough you know, extra time to knit, be with her close family with whom she lives, read, write, uh, you know, make the most of lockdown. But what she actually said to me was that she couldn't talk to me right then and there because life was so overwhelming that she just had to go back to bed. And it's, it's rather funny, but that is the reality. And I'm sure that my friend isn't alone in experiencing that existential weight of fear and uncertainty that makes us question why we're getting up out of bed each day. Perhaps you felt it and maybe maybe you feel that right now, perhaps you feel precisely the same way. Uh, one speaker recently put it as a bubbling up of brokenness, you know, when all of those usual activities or perhaps distractions that have occupied our days like school runs, business trips, office meetings, you know, day trips, meals out, theatre, when all those things have been removed and we're just left with the four walls and the drum of our hearts beating by the moments and minutes, there's no escape. We cannot run away from ourselves. It's as one philosopher, Nietzsche said, you looked for the heaviest burden you could find and it was you. Who can ever be rid of you? Uh, the pandemic has created room for our, for our brokenness to bubble up in ourselves and in the lives of our non-Christian friends and family. So as those layers of self-sufficiency are stripped away, after all, you know, who can outrun a global threat? Many are experiencing that heavy burden of being, that heavy burden of being themselves. You know, what hope is there? We cannot run away from ourselves and there's nothing to run towards either. Secularism, according to Humanists UK, in part, is a commitment to the principle of establishing a neutral public space in which all can meet on equal terms, regardless of religious beliefs. And there's a, there's a lot to say on this, but I just like to focus on one big thing. And that's the reality that there is no neutral public space. To believe that there is, is one of the biggest, most devastating deceptions of late modernity because we're all worshippers, aren't we? The only question is, what will we worship? Our secular state has created substitutions for God, you know, idols, uh, false gods. And the thing about these false gods is that we're told that they will break our hearts. This is what we're seeing. Nations, industries, economies, they rise and fall. Relationships in lockdown, they're bending and breaking. Inquiries into divorce have risen by 54% from March and domestic abuse and violence has risen. Many have lost or they will lose their jobs. And of course, you know, we can't forget this. Hundreds of thousands of people have died globally and over a million have been ill. The secular gods, the things usually run to for hope and for happiness, like retail therapy, an extra glass of wine, a weekend away in Malaga, or Malaga, commanding the respect of a boardroom, one's investment portfolio, marital bliss, uh, the, the freedom of singleness, health, they're all being toppled much more visibly than usual. In the West, it's like we've been walking up these stairs of progress, and just as we're about to put our foot down on that next step, it was removed suddenly. We've lost our footing, we've tripped over, and we've fallen down. These empty spaces of materialism and consumerism are far from empty, and nor are they neutral. The, the thinker Jamie Smith gives us an example of malls, shopping centres, as cathedrals of worship. It's where the faithful gather to find holy objects, which they then present before the checkout altars, presided by priests of sale assistants and cashiers. And this space is not neutral. It's profoundly religious. He says it's a religion of transaction, of communion and exchange. 
the things that made in this secular space cannot heal us at our time of need. Where are they? You know, the doors are closed. Everyone has been sent home. They've shut up shop and abandoned their worshippers just when they've needed them the most. Secular gods make poor lovers. They leave us when we need them the most. Chris, you've done a really powerful job there, I think, critiquing secularism and showing how those secular hopes simply don't work. So, OK, let's uh, now turn to the Christian faith. How does how does Christian hope look different than those false gods of secularism? Yeah, thanks for asking, Andy. I was scrolling through some articles the other day and you've probably come across this too, Andy, but they spoke of how sales of the Bible have risen by about 55 percent in April. And there was a similar upswing in the number of downloads of the Bible app. And I just wonder why. Why is that? Why have Google searches on prayer and Christianity skyrocketed during COVID-19? And, you know, I know it sounds a bit strange, but I do wonder if it comes back to Nietzsche's predicament. What do we do with our heaviest burden? Rather than shutting up shop, as the secular gods have done, the Son of God has made his home with us. And this is what makes Christianity unique and therefore the Christian hope we are given by our triune God. Christian hope is unique. You've probably heard it said before, but it's, you know, it's like a glorious diamond and you hold it up to the light and there are just so many different sparkling, equally just glorious facets to it. But here's the centermost point of that diamond. Christian hope is unique because Jesus is unique. He is the God who refuses to watch the world burn and in love makes his home with humans so that we can know his father. And Peter calls the hope that he has given us a living hope. In his letters, Peter is encouraging persecuted, displaced, suffering Christians what true hope looks like. And as he does that, he lets us in on what is unique about Jesus and therefore what is unique about the hope he offers us in himself. The letter of first Peter is littered with it. And I just love to read a couple of verses uh, from the first chapter of Peter. So I'm just going to draw our gaze to the verses uh, three to five, uh, where it writes, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. So Jesus is giving us a living hope through the resurrection. He hasn't given us a dead hope. It's not like a new iPhone, which looks amazing. It's great, but then you open it up and then for some reason it just won't turn on. Jesus isn't a dud. He gives us a hope that turns on and in God's power actually keeps us going, trusting until we receive the full inheritance. But how, you know, how does Jesus actually do that? Jesus gives us a living hope, not a dead hope, because he triumphed over the grave. The living hope doesn't point to an uncertain outcome. It's not one that may or may not make it. You know, it's not like blagging it on a job interview, you know, just thinking, go for it. It may or may not work out. It's not the lockdown optimism of embarking on those challenging DIY projects, you know, thinking you hope it might come together. And if it doesn't, you can just call it shabby chic. Instead, with Jesus, what he has put in, we get to cash out. We get to withdraw that with confidence because he's already done it. He's gone ahead of us and made a way. And we only need to walk weakly behind him. This is a hope then that will follow us through all the trials of life and even our own deaths because Jesus is alive right now. The outcome isn't a gamble. It isn't hanging in the balance based on how good we've been or how productive we've been during lockdown. The Christian hope is a uniquely secure hope for us because no other hope is able to pierce the darkness and come through brighter on the other side. The small lights of the secular gods, as we've seen, are quickly blown out by any small wind of suffering. When it comes to Jesus, the winds blow, they often howl, but because Jesus lives, the darkness is not the end if we have been given the living hope of his life. And as Jesus himself said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus then, unlike the secular gods, will not leave us when things get a little rough, when we feel a little bit grumpy, when we face financial ruin, despair, 
ruined marriages and uh, relationships. He is the lover of our souls, to whom we can give our greatest burden, ourselves. We do not have to carry the crippling weight of life. And this is more than a personal hope. This is a hope for the whole of the world. This is a hope that shines for all people in all places. A hope for a messy, hurting, bruised world. A hope that will restore and renew the earth. As overwhelmed as my friend is feeling through fear and uncertainty, there is another better way for her in Jesus. So what do we do with that heaviest burden? How do we point others to the place where their burden can be removed? And, you know, a little bit like Pilgrim and Pilgrim's Progress, experience the relief of its release. Enjoy a secure and certain hope in Jesus. Because after all, Andy, is it even possible to do evangelism right now? Let's be honest, for uh, many of us, evangelism is tough at the best of times. Even when life is running normally, many Christians were fearful about sharing our faith at work, at home, at school with our neighbours and so forth. Now, of course, in uh, recent months, evangelism has become even tougher. What with the uh, lockdown and restrictions, uh, that's limited who we can meet and made evangelism much harder. Although it's also given those of us who are nervous about evangelism a great excuse. You know, I'd love to go and do some evangelism, uh, but a shame, right? The government simply won't let me. Well, there's also the temptation uh, in these days, both for individual Christians, but also for churches, if we're not careful, to allow evangelism to drop somewhat down our priority list, to invest all of our time and energy into focusing on our own needs, our own spiritual concerns. In the case of churches, all of our energy goes into keeping our structures going. But we need to remember that the gospel imperative is, is outward. It's not inward. Jesus uh, didn't say, go and make disciples, but, you know, you can wait until it's easier to do so. So what about, instead of thinking of what we can't do, uh, given the pandemic, what about we turn it around and we think about what we can do in terms of evangelism? You know, one of my favourite uh, books of the Bible during these days has been the book of Philippians. Um, Paul is a terrific inspiration there because there he is uh, in prison, chained up between two Roman soldiers, and he doesn't spend his time uh, worrying and whinging and complaining, oh, you know, I can't go and do another missionary travel, but rather he turns it into an opportunity. I can share my faith with my guards. And he tell, describes in Philippians the incredible opportunity that his chains have opened up and how the gospel has spread uh, among all of the prison and even Caesar's household. So for us in these uh, pandemic days, let's ask ourselves the question, rather not what we can't do, but are there opportunities created by COVID-19 uh, for evangelism? And I, I think there are. Let me share some ideas drawn in part from Healthy Faith, uh, the book that I and Christy and a few others wrote for, uh, for IVP a few months ago. And I'm sharing a few ideas from my chapter on evangelism in that book. And I want to suggest that the first thing we can do, the first thing that's uh, crucial uh, in terms of evangelism and sharing hope right now is we need to pray. I know that sounds obvious, but I want to encourage you to pray particularly uh, for one particular thing. Pray specifically for opportunities. Pray that the Lord would open up opportunities for you to share the kind of hope that Christie's talked about. You can also pray that the Lord uh, reveals to you perhaps opportunities that you hadn't noticed right under your nose for evangelism. Secondly, uh, take the time, if you haven't already, to get to know your neighbours. My wife and I live in a community where most people, most of the time, keep themselves uh, shut away indoors and we don't see them. But actually, since lockdown, we've noticed we've seen people more. People appear more than their front gardens more often. More people are walking around our local streets than ever before. People are craving human contact. So why not look for opportunities to get to know people right there in your community? Be very non-British and say hello to people you meet. Invite neighbours around uh, for a barbecue, now that's allowed, or a socially distant, distant piece of cake. Hospitality is an amazing and often overlooked evangelism opportunity. Third, take the time to interact uh, with the people that you come across every day, the Amazon delivery driver, the postman, the, the checkout person at the supermarket. Take the time to say hello, strike up a conversation, ask how they're doing. And as you do that, prayerfully sow seeds, create opportunities in which conversations about the gospel might flourish. And then you can do the same thing. Fourthly, do it online. If you're on social media, Facebook or Instagram, or one of those platforms, be really prayerful and intentional about what you post. Don't just rant about politics or grumble about life or just share, you know, amusing pictures of your cat. Look for ways to share 
really good Christian content that makes people think, that might start a conversation right there in your social media feed. For example, you could use one of the short answer videos that we produce at Solas. They've been used over a million times now by people to start evangelistic conversations in contexts like Facebook. Uh, there's also ministries like Alpha and Christianity Explored. have also got great resources that you can use in a similar way. More people than ever are checking out Christian content right now. So use those resources and opportunities. In fact, a few months ago, uh, The Guardian, not a newspaper uh, known for being particularly friendly to Christians, ran a major story reporting that 25% of Brits had watched a religious service or event online since lockdown began. That's a figure that rises to 33%, one in three of young adults. So online and offline, look for ways to make connections with people and to sow opportunities, uh, take advantage of opportunities to start conversations where you can sow pointers to the gospel and point to the kind of hope that we have as Christians that Christy talked about. Thanks so much, Andy. There's so many kind of practical ways in which we can engage, but how is it that we can actually make the most of these opportunities? Well, that's a great question, uh, Christy. How can we weave the gospel into conversations, everyday conversations, without looking like we are religiously mugging people? You know, the Amazon driver comes to the door, says, here's your parcel, Dr. Bannister. And I reply, why, thank you. Here's a parcel of good news for you. Cringe factor heavy. Is there a better way? Well, I find the best way, the most helpful, productive way to move a conversation towards the gospel is to prayerfully look for ways to ask good questions. Questions are a powerful evangelistic tool and they're easy to use whether you've been a Christian for six days or 60 years. And Jesus used questions all of the time. He used them to start conversations or sometimes he would use them to respond to other people's questions. For example, consider the famous story in the Gospels of Jesus and the rich young ruler. That's the young man who comes to Jesus and says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, he's saying, Jesus, you look like a good religious leader. You're a famous rabbi and moral teacher, so you obviously are going to heaven. How do I get there? And Jesus untangles that whole mess of wrong ideas with a simple question. Why do you call me good? Only God is good. You know, I find beginning with questions in a conversation really helpful. An obvious starter is, how are you doing? But often as Brits, we don't go much further. So what about uh, moving to a question like, how are you really doing? You know, is your job okay with all of these layoffs? Is your family okay? And depending on the answer you get, you could ask, is there any way I can help as a follow-up? I also like to find ways to share honestly how I'm uh, doing, even if I'm struggling, even if it's a bad day. But then in doing that, I'm looking for ways to talk about and ask questions about, for me, what is the key issue? How do you find hope given all that's happening? I love asking people that question. Listen. Ask follow-up questions, but look for the chance to share where, as a Christian, your hope uniquely lies. And as I do that, as I ask questions, I'm also prayerfully looking for ways I can compare and contrast. As Christy shared with us a, uh, a few minutes ago, there is no hope in secularism, so look for ways to bring that contrast out. For example, a question I've been using during the pandemic uh, is finding the right opportunity to say to a friend a question like this, you know, have you ever wondered... Uh, about the fact that if we are just atoms and particles, just time plus chance plus natural selection, if this life is all that there is, then isn't COVID-19 doing us a favour? It's weeding out the weak and the sick and the elderly. It's improving the strength of the herd. But we haven't responded that way as society. Rather, we've crashed our entire economy to protect the weak and the infirm and the elderly. Why do you think that is? See, I think that reveals a profoundly Christian impulse, and I want our friends to think about that. It's a provocative question, but it connects to the fact that deep down, even our secular friends and neighbours and colleagues know in the core of their being that life is about more than survival and reproduction. What you want to do is tease out why. So as we talk to friends and neighbours, as we make the most of every opportunity, uh, as Paul reminds us to do in Colossians, let's, let's make sure that we ask good questions, we listen well, and as we speak, we seek not to impart our own cleverness, but to point people uh, to Jesus, to connect the conversation to Jesus. Look for any opportunity as you, uh, as you have conversations with friends and neighbours to say things like, you know, what you've just said reminds me of a story that Jesus told. Or this conversation reminds me of something that Jesus said. Or what you said there just reminds me of something that Jesus once did. Find ways to connect the conversation to Jesus. Ask good questions. Listen well. Ask more good questions. 
and prayerfully look for ways to connect the conversation you're having uh, to the hope and the story of Jesus. Andy, thank you. What I really love about what you've just shared is that it's just so easy, isn't it, to say this reminds me about something uh, that Jesus once said. Do you have any kind of stories as to what this might look like in practice? How does this actually work? Well, yeah, I mean, God is at work in so many ways. Let me just give you a couple of examples of, uh, of ways I've seen this. Uh, a few weeks back, uh, just uh, around Easter, my wife, who has all of the best ideas in our house, had a brilliant idea. We went and we bought a job lot of John Lennox's wonderful little book, uh, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? We popped each book into a gift bag along with, a, with an Easter egg and a little hand-drawn card my kids had drawn. And we delivered those gift bags to houses around our neighbourhood. Some houses we knew well, others we just barely knew them, but always where we had a vague connection. And we dropped the gift bag on the doorstep, rang the doorbell, stuck back with the necessary two metres, and when they opened the door said a socially distanced Happy Easter. And that little gift sparked so many conversations and as people responded to us and were happy to engage and we're really excited as we come towards the end of lockdown, hopefully in a, in a short while, to begin picking up uh, the seeds that we sowed there. Second idea comes not from me, but from a friend. Uh, a friend said to me that what they'd started doing was they looked to see whether their community, their street, had a, had a WhatsApp or Facebook group, and it did, and they joined it. And then they said they started looking for opportunities where you can step in and, and help, where somebody says, I'm struggling with something, I need some help, uh, leap in and offer to help. And when people thank you or compliment you on what you've done, be very non-British and say, look, you don't need to thank me. I'm doing this because I want to show the love of Jesus to my, to my neighbours and my community. Trust me, it may feel awkward, but you will start a conversation as people are grateful for what you've done and surprised that you haven't taken the glory, but passed it, reflected it to somebody else. And in all of this, remember, pray, 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 and pray some more. Pray for the Lord to open up opportunities. You know, you don't need to force things uh, or be false or, or to be something you're not, but it may be that uh, the Lord brings to mind opportunities or relationships or situations where maybe you've shied away from being a public Christian. And see, my prayer for each one of you uh, listening to this seminar, wherever you are, is that you'll see the Lord use you in ways you never considered before. Yeah, we live in challenging times. And, and yes, the spread of COVID-19 has made doing church and doing evangelism the old way uh, difficult, almost impossible for the moment. But let's show the world that it's not just coronavirus that can go viral. Let's grab hold of opportunities, make most of every opportunity that the Lord sends. And let's show that the gospel of Jesus can go viral too. Thanks, Andy and Christy, for such a stimulating and practical challenge for us to share our hope in Jesus with our friends and family. Now, wonderfully, we've got Andy in the studio. Welcome, Andy. Great to be with you. And Christy is online and they're here to uh, answer all, all of our questions. Uh, Andy, where have you come from this morning? I have come all the way from Dundee in Scotland, so 6am start. So, wow. Uh, yeah, lots of coffee inside me this morning. <laughs> Excellent, good. And Christy, where are you? I'm beaming in from sunny Leicestershire. Oh, it's glorious. Wonderful. Just so great to have you both with us. And we've got a whole ton of questions. We're just going to uh, dive in right, uh, right now. Here's the first question. Christy, this is for you. Um, someone says, we spoke to our neighbours early on in lockdown about Christ. How do we pick up on those conversations now? Hmm. Oh, that's such an excellent question. Thank you. Um, I think Andy picked up on this in, in his talk a few minutes ago when he was saying how we cultivate conversations with friends by asking the question, how are you doing? And then how are you really doing? And particularly now, you know, we've got masks, uh, introductions of masks, there's unemployment, there's still quite a bit of uncertainty over the future as well. Mm. Those conversations are just going to continue, aren't they? So I think my biggest kind of advice would be to carry on being human and asking the next question. So what did you last ask them? How are they doing? And keep that relationship going. Lovely. So just keep that relational element. That's, that's really helpful. Anything to add, Sandy? Yeah. Yeah, I think the main thing I'd, uh, I'd add to that is I think sometimes in, a, in evangelism, John T, we try and leap too quickly to sort of square 10. So yes. we reconnect with our friends. Yeah. And before we fully reconnected, we're straight into, you know, sort of shoehorning Christianity. Have been washed in the blood of the lamb. In, ex exactly. Right. And so as Christy said, make that connection, find out how they're doing, take those steps, and then find that way, I think, to prayerfully, uh, you know, bring your faith into the conversation. Um, but do that through relationship, do that through hospitality. So it's a slow, steady... Yeah, play the, play, the, play the long game, or at least the medium game yeah. in your conversation. 
Question for you, Andy. Um, what do I say to my non-Christian friend when they ask me why is God letting so many people, including Christians, die of COVID-19? From Helena. Thanks for that question. Great question. Um, thanks, Helena, from uh, Bristol, Bristol. From Bristol. So, uh, absolutely brilliant question, uh, Helena. Thank you uh, for that. And I mentioned in my uh, in my talk uh, one resource, which is John Lennox's yeah. uh, book, "Where Is God in a Coronavirus World." Uh, John Piper, Tom Wright have written on that as well. So I start with those because it's a big question. I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts, okay. um, but hugely encourage you to dig into some of the resources that are out there, Helena. First, I'd say a couple of things to your friends who's asking that question. First thing I would do is I would gently turn that question around and say the question of suffering uh, and the question of where, what do we do with pain and brokenness and hurt and evil uh, forces itself on all of us. And of course, if we live in a purely godless universe, then there's some conclusions that follow. And one of the conclusions that follows is that, you know, COVID-19 is a beautiful example of uh, evolution in action. Along comes the coronavirus and it's sweeping out the weak, the elderly, uh, you know, it's strengthening the herd. It's, it's doing a wonderful job mm. of survival of the fittest. But we haven't responded that way as a society. Mm. We've shielded the weak, we've crashed our economy to look after those who biologically are, are, are worth less. Um, that I find deeply, deeply fascinating. We've responded in a very Christian way as a society. So I would prod into that to start with and see how your friend uh, responds. Then the thing I'd add as well that I think is very important, Helena, Helena is to say, look, look, Christians have always been aware that we live in a world where there's suffering. There was suffering when the first early church got going. Uh, Christians suffered terrible persecutions under the Roman Empire. Uh, there were plagues and pandemics and disease and famine and earthquakes and wars. Christians have never labored under the misconception that being a Christian renders you immune from the suffering of the world because we follow a Lord who, who went through and experienced that suffering and that pain. What Christianity promises you is resources to deal with that suffering. It promises you that pain and death are not the last word and it gives you a hope that is not some kind of vague ephemeral hope but a hope that is grounded in the very concrete fact of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So Christianity gives you these incredible resources to help see you through these kind of dark times. Psalm 23, God is with us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's where I'd begin. That's very helpful. Do check out those resources and throw it back to them and um, clarify what the Christian hope is. That's very helpful. A question for you, uh, Christy. Um, a really heartfelt question from someone here. I really, and that's in bold letters, I really want my friends to be saved, but I worry about being too pushy, especially in the work mm. situation. I do try hardly any interest. Mm. I guess you can hear the question there, kind of how much should I try? What should I do in this situation? Christy. Mm, that's such a great question. Thank you for asking it. I think my uh, initial kind of thought is that if you're concerned about being too pushy, you probably aren't actually being pushy at all. And so I think I'd be wanting to think through kind of what questions, what kind of could you ask to cultivate and to build a conversation with friends in the workplace? And often I think we think, I think Andy mentioned this earlier, that evangelism is kind of going in, all guns blazing. I'm going to kind of tell you all about Jesus right now. And if that's the way in which we think what it looks like to communicate the gospel, then of course that's going to be hard hitting because they might just be chatting about their weekend, but you want to talk yeah. about atonement or whatever so um i think just start small build on those relationships and as you kind of talk about your weekends you can like throw in what you've been doing about going to church or something that you just read over the weekend that really struck you and how you're kind of processing that so i wonder if yeah if you think that you're being too pushy you probably aren't and i'd probably start by just asking lots and lots of questions until they ask you one back that's lovely. Very helpful. I've got another question. I'm going to go to Andy on this one. I think this is a question which probably all of us are asking. How do you witness to people who are doing well and are very happy and don't see any need for Jesus and generally think that this life is all that there is? Well, a great question. Yeah, brilliant question, uh, John T, and thank you for whoever asked that. I'm going to start as I started my last answer and give you a couple of resources 
and then uh, give you a couple of thoughts. It's very interesting that a very uh, famous book on evangelism and giving a reason why we believe what we believe is Tim Keller's book, Reason for God, uh, that came out uh, almost 20 years ago now, I believe. But what's interesting, that book deals with the very common objections that people raise to the Christian faith. But then Tim began to realize there was a whole generation of people who weren't even interested in those questions because of exactly this reason. They were happy, they were satisfied, they saw no need for God. And so Tim Keller wrote a follow-up book called Making Sense of God. And there's some brilliant stuff in there to help you deal with, with friends uh, like this. But a couple of thoughts for you. When I meet folks who are in that kind of position, I like to do a couple of things. I like to try and look for good questions to ask, to prod uh, a little bit. One question to begin exploring with people is what happens when, uh, when those things don't work out? It's you know, very easy to think the life is great, that the job is great, the marriage is great, the kids are great, everything is wonderful. But there will come a time for, where for all of us when, uh, when life uh, deals as a, a hand of cards that is not so good. And one of the interesting things is COVID-19 and the pandemic has brought that more to the fore for many people. I have many friends and, and neighbours and, and acquaintances who, you know, life was wonderful and then suddenly they've been furloughed suddenly they've been made redundant, suddenly they've lost a family member. And I think one of the reasons that I think COVID-19 has in some ways caused a little bit of a spiritual awakening in some circles, it's forced those questions to the fore. So you can gently prod your friends, you know, what happens, have you thought about what happens when, uh, you know, life is, is not so smelling of roses? You can also turn it in the direction of justice and say, you know, you've got a wonderful life it seems, you've got a great house, great car, great family, you know, what would you say to somebody who hasn't got the advantages that you've had? You know, we live in a world where we're far more mm. conscious of privilege. What do you say to somebody, uh, you know, who's living on the breadline, to somebody who's experienced racial injustice, uh, to somebody who has, you know, life has, uh, has uh, dealt them suffering and pain and not the advantages that, that you've had? How does your worldview help them out? And I think the powerful thing about the Christian faith, it shakes and challenges those of us who are perhaps a little bit too comfortable and it gives uh, comfort to those who've been afflicted. Uh, and I think those are two areas I would press into. Uh, but again, Tim Keller's book, Making Sense of God, uh, lots of great resources in there for exactly uh, that type of person and that type of conversation. That's really helpful, those two lines of inquiry. I guess the third one that eventually we have to start talking about is judgment. That even though your life might be perfect now, one day you have to give an account to God for the life that you've, you've lived. Absolutely right. Uh, um, Christy, over to you. Next question. Uh, what's the place of listening in evangelism? Oh, central. Absolutely central. What a wonderful question. I um, Yeah, often when we're considering how to talk with our friends, we think, OK, I have to have. We're all looking for this kind of silver bullet, aren't we, that we can just kind of put it out there and then they will repent and believe the good news. And we just overlook the, the important role of listening, don't we? So I, I actually, it's, yeah, I cannot speak of this more highly. There's a great book called Questioning Evangelism by Randy mm. Newman. And in that he talks about how is it that we can ask questions? What kind of questions can we ask? And making sure that they're open-ended questions so that our friends can actually um, respond with more than a yes or a no. So. Yeah, listening, I think, takes a central role in our evangelism because how Jesus doesn't come to us in a vacuum. Um, the eternal son takes on flesh. And, and as he lives in the creation, he's always showing, as we see in the Gospels, what it looks like to know God through the ordinary, everyday things of life, like agriculture mm. and farming. And so how do we kind of contextualize the Gospel uh, is really important when it comes to our friends. And so I think listening helps us to then know how we can give them the best answer when they then ask us. So I, again, I'd go back to the Andy and I have heard this quite a few times from a friend of ours. He says, keep asking questions until they ask you a question back. So, yes, listening is central in that, I think, to be able to do that well and persuasively. That's, that's helpful. I'm seeing that's a note between both of you, actually. Questions are a massive part of our evangelism. And Randy says, actually, that's mm. a central part of Jesus' evangelism as well, isn't it? He was a great question asker. Exactly. Um, Andy, over to you. Uh, you talk about being intentional, intentional in our use of social media. Uh, do you have any examples or resources or, for how we can do that best? 
Yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's a great question, John T. And what's interesting, you know, a while ago, there were just a few of us, I think, sort of using social media. And then, you know, along came COVID-19 and every church under the sun is now kind of trying to sort of um, figure this one out. But the yeah. great thing uh, about social media, of course, is many of us, uh, hopefully all of us, but certainly many of us have probably got a good range of non-Christian friends on social media because it's just the, the nature of the beast that you tend to accumulate kind of sort of a variegated tribe and of course sharing stuff is really easy you come across a great piece of content it's very easy to share it and uh, you can also I think some people find it's a little bit easier to perhaps be more out there on in terms of evangelism than maybe you might be uh, sort of one-to-one -one. so if you're the kind of person who's nervous talking to friends or neighbors or colleagues about Jesus, maybe you can find the courage prayerfully to, to share a little bit of content on your Facebook feed. So where's a great place to start? Let me give you, uh, I'm going to give you two uh, recommendations. Obviously, there's the uh, Keswick Ministries website and everything linked through there, all great stuff. Um, <laughs> well, there, Andy, like, thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Okay, that's uh, <laughs> the, the, uh, the invoice will be in the post. You can come back, yeah. Come back again. Um, two great things I'd recommend. Um, Christianity Explored, uh, Randy Newman, who uh, Christy just mentioned, has done a lot of work with them. And Christianity Explored have got some great content on their, on their website, wonderful for sharing. And then a little kind of a bit of self-promotion, the organization I work for, SOLAS, S-O-L-A-S, -S, the SOLAS Center for Public Christianity. If you put SOLAS into, into Google or Facebook or social media or find us, we've produced over the last three years a video series called Short Answers. Uh, we've got about 75 videos now where we take a common question or challenge about the Christian faith and we produce a three or four minute uh, video answering it. It's very non-Christian friendly, uh, no cringe factor and uh, about one and a half million downloads on that series now. Go check those out and encourage you to share one. Have a look through the videos, see what you think your friends might find interesting. And the great thing is if a conversation starts on social media and you get asked a question you can't answer, there's probably another video that you could say, well, I think this might answer your question. So Christianity Explored, uh, Solas Center for Public Christianity, and just encourage you, go out there and, and share. This lunchtime, when you're not watching something from Keswick, why don't you try it? Share one of those videos on your uh, social media feed, see what happens. It's a great challenge to put out there, Andy. Thank you. Christy, one for you. How do events in church interact with personal evangelism? Is it an either or? Mm, what a great question. And um, no, I don't think it is an either or. I think it's a, it's a both and in that the local church is um, is a place in which we we reach the nations, isn't it? And so it's wonderful that we have organisations such as Solas, which Andy is a part of, um, and, and other ministries as well, who are able to come alongside the local church and help local churches to be able to put on really excellent events to reach their friends and family and community. And so I wouldn't say it's um, it's an either or in competition, but it's a how do we steward the gifts that the Lord has given to his church and then be able to kind of serve and recognize that there are people who are very well placed to do this but that evangelism starts and ends in the local church and so I'd say it's it's a both and rather than either or how can we serve God's great mission um, to the world in, in partnering together to be able to do that well. Very helpful indeed. Um, a question maybe back to you again Christy. Um, hello May, sorry, this is the question, not me saying hi. Uh, hello, <laughs> hey, may Jonesy. I ask this question for the evangelism seminar, please? I have been a Christian for many years, long to share Jesus with my friends, but it always sounds so odd and unnatural coming out of my mouth. Yes, I can write and sing about him very easily. Should I accept that this is my best way of evangelizing? Mm. I always feel I'm falling short somehow in not being able to verbally sell my beliefs. Thanks. Mm. Thank you for that question. Gosh. Yes, that's such a, an honest and transparent and thoughtful question. Thank you so much for, for sending that one in. It sounds like the Lord has wonderfully gifted you in, in writing and in um, putting together hymns and songs. And if that's the case, it doesn't sound like um, you're, you're lacking a, a speaking gift, so to speak. I wonder if there's a way in which you could cultivate your writing so as to give you confidence when it comes to speaking um, verbally about who Jesus is. So if there's a way that you could perhaps write down um, what it is you'd like to say to your friends or how you'd put that and then just have that in the back of your heart or your mind and then perhaps in the next conversation you might be able to say to them, oh, I prepared this the other day or I've just been thinking about this. Would you like to listen to this or read this? Or if it's spontaneously in a conversation, perhaps you could then bring that in later too. Because again, it's, 
it's not about selling our beliefs though i think that's often how we mm. feel don't we where yeah. it's like oh i really have to stand up for jesus here and i'm the one who has to persuade them that that he is the way the truth and the life and i suppose it's just resting that we when we come to sharing the hope that we have we're doing that from a place of approval we're not doing it for approval and that the Holy Spirit is is the one who is able to convict and warm hearts to the beauty of Jesus. So, yeah, I'd, I'd really kind of uh, want to encourage you to rest in Jesus and to use the gifts that he's given you well to that end. Christy, that's great. Uh, really quick, final yep. one for you, Andy. Is it, to, is it fair to say we're all evangelists for what we're passionate about? How do you help us apply this to talking to our neighbours and friends about Jesus? Yeah. I think the simple answer, John T, is absolutely, you know, whether it's our favourite football team or some great holiday we've been on or even our new phone that we've got, you know, we're very, we find that very easy to enthuse about that. Mm. But when it comes to Jesus, we sometimes clam up. Two thoughts here. I think obviously what often causes us to clam up is, is fear. It's that fear of looking stupid. It's fear of making the gospel look bad. You know, it's fear of doing more damage through opening our mouths than shutting it. I think the first thing we should do is bring that fear to the Lord and pray yeah. that pray that through. Share that faith, share that fear with others as well. Don't be a, don't be a lone ranger with evangelism. Find a buddy that you can share your fears with, pray that through, encourage one another. But then put into practice some of the things that Christy and I have shared to, uh, in the Q&A and in the seminar, especially around asking questions. Mm. It's much easier to learn to ask good questions to get the conversation going than, than imagine we have to memorize this carefully crafted gospel presentation and download it onto our friends. Be prayerfully seeking good conversations and asking that the Lord would keep you faithful and would you use those in sharing the gospel with your friends. And, uh, and then just relax a little. As Christy reminded us, remember it's the Holy Spirit's job ultimately to draw people to him. Don't take all the pressure on yourself, uh, but get out there, give it a go and see how the Lord works through you. On, on that note, let me just pray for us all. Father, thank you that we have a terrific message for the world of your son crucified for forgiveness of sins. Help us to trust him as we try to speak of him. Mm. We ask that even today you'll give us opportunities. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Guys, it's been terrific to have you with us. Thank you so much for driving me down and tuning in, um, Christy. Uh, and thanks Pleasure. for all of your wise um, wisdom that you've given us. This is the end of our seminar now for today. And next, we've got Count Everyone In with Pete and Christine Windmill. Um, this is going to be an accessible short devotion, which will be accessible uh, for all. Do come back this evening for our evening celebration with Graham Daniels. And tomorrow morning for our final session, starting at 9 um, with a prayer meeting, and then at 10 for our final Bible, final Bible reading with Chris Rash. Thanks so much for tuning in. See you soon. <laughs>